back to work. Um, getting closer to lunch. People getting hungry? Ready to go? It's not time yet. I'm going to send you to lunch probably more inspired than you've been thus far. And there's been a lot of inspiration in this room and on this yeah. stage. So hopefully you're ready. Um, and if you're sensing a theme here, I'm going to kick off this next segment with yet another story. So prepare yourselves. Um, the year was 2006, and I was guiding on Mount Everest. I had an international team uh, of clients. And on an Everest expedition with a higher level of clientele, you tend to bring the kitchen sink. You bring good cheese, you bring good meats, um, possibly a box of wine for, uh, for your clients to enjoy when they're in base camp during the rotations down the mountain. And one day I was sitting in our dining tent, surrounded by all this abundance, and this wizened, tan, bearded, scruffy gentleman wanders into my dining tent and just very simply said, hi. My name's Pete. I'm from Colorado, too. Hey, what do you have there on your table? And proceeded to sit down and eat most of my snacks and proceeded to come back day after day after day and consume most of my snacks. And thus began um, a wonderful friendship closing in on 20 years. So Peter McBride, um, I put him in the category of Ansel Adams, Bradford Washburn, the photographers and the storytellers of our ecosystems, of our generation, of the things that we hold most dear and most important. Um, Pete, ironically enough, on that expedition, was on assignment for National Geographic, following the Sherpa community that worked in and on the mountain, making sure the route was safe for climbers. He's been on assignment for Nat Geo and other organizations in over 75 countries around the world. He's presented for the World Economic Forum, Pixar, Google. I mean, the list goes on and on. And he is also, and this still stuns me to this day that he still has knees to walk around on in 2016, walked the entire length of the Grand Canyon on foot between River and Rim was the book that was generated from that expedition and uh, it won a National Outdoor Book Award. And it's incredible. His latest book, Seeing Silence, which I'm going to put a little plug in for you there, Pedro, um, is for sale. And it's outside. And I sat down a couple of days ago with my six-year-old daughter and flipped through all of these majestic images from around the world, hoping in the deepest parts of my heart that we'll be able to see those together at some point and that the work that we do in this room and around the world that Pete highlights um, will continue to drive and influence that conservation, that stewardship, and that passion for, for decades to come. So we're going to be doing a drawing for one of Pete's books at the reception tonight, so stick around. Um, and I, like I said, he's got a few for sale in the lobby. But I, I am so honored to, to welcome my friend um, and an incredibly talented individual to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Pete McBride. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Luis. Thank you. Um, I, I haven't thanked you properly for the snacks. Um, <laughs> It was very generous of you. Thank you. Uh, you got us through. Um, thank you all for having us. Thank you, Beth. Thank you for the Salazar Center. Um, I know everybody has been sitting for a while, so I'm going to take you on a little journey, um, a visual journey, um, about the Colorado River. We've all been hearing about water and some drought. I'm going to take us to the borderlands. I'm going to take a source to sea. Then I'm going to bring us back up to talk about some of the stories I've done recently. Uh, what I thought I would do, though, is just to um, kind of waken us up a little bit, is I wanted to give an idea that um, a few years ago, I was down in Antarctica and looking at water and looking at climate change and how these structures, these 120-foot natural sculpted glacial arches that you'd occasionally see were just crashing in front of us. Um, it was an assignment for National Geographic. We were kayaking the coast and doing, yet again, another assignment far away from home. And at the end of this assignment, I needed to take a shower desperately. We've been in kayaks for six weeks, and I finally got the courage and the muster that I thought I would just take a little dip in the ocean. Uh, this was on one of these climate change weird days. It was about 65 degrees, and I decided to take a little leap, plunge. None of my other colleagues wanted to go, so they took over my camera. Um, bad decision on many fronts. Uh, water temperature is 29 degrees because it's so saline. I tried to show off with a flip. I couldn't do that. I couldn't clear the little iceberg. Um, I think some outdoor company got a hold of this for the underwear and said some ad about got shrinkage, which I'm not sure what they meant. But um, 
what happened to me, I think, at this point is my wanderlust uh, experienced some shrinkage, and I decided it was time to come home um, back to this part of the world, Colorado. I'd been hearing about stories of water my entire life. I'd worked in water. I grew up on a small cattle ranch three hours from here in the Rocky Mountains. And I decided it was time, instead of going on another expedition somewhere to meet people like Luis and bougie tents, um, that it was time to really hunker in and focus on my backyard. And so I decided to quite literally follow the irrigation water that my family uses um, and look at it and where it goes. So the Colorado River, um, as you all know, starts right here um, in the Rocky Mountains. 50% of the drinking water in this city comes from that river. Um, it's an remarkable lifeline. It supports seven states, now 40 million people, um, and Mexico. Uh, you can see the what I call the big straws, the red lines. Uh, there are 22 of them that come through the Continental Divide over to this side of the state. And amazingly, when I started this project, is I realized quickly that the challenges are not just at the end or downstream, but they start right at the top. Uh, you see this brown snow, that's dust on snow. That's dust that's blown in from the west of us due to increased development, um, fragile desert ecosystems. And that's actually holding the sun's temperature, melting it off at a faster rate. Plants are drinking sooner than they used to. Trans evaporation, it's called, we're losing about 5% of the river due to that. Now, as we look at the river flowing down from the Continental Divide and the top of the frame there, that's where these trans basin diversions go through, uh, it looks like a perfectly wonderful, pristine river. Even at this stage, it's lost at about 50% of its historic flow. And of course, it supports huge industries. Recreation is one. At the time I took this picture, the recreation industry was quoted at producing $26 billion a year. At the time, that was greater than US Airways progressive insurance. Pretty remarkable, because we often don't put valuation on our natural ecosystems. I, of course, looked at agriculture, having grown up in that world. It is the big straw. Over 70% of the river goes to that. I looked at industry, and of course, I looked at its natural beauty, the loop carving through canyonlands. Um, I did a lot of aerial work, in part because I, I knew a pilot who was a bit of a cantankerous type. Um, he encouraged me to get into water, um, and, um, but he was also a great pilot. Uh, he was actually my father. Um, he's been looking and loving at a landscape from a pilot's perspective for many years and realizing how quickly it's been changing. And as we flew downstream into Lake Powell at the time, it was at 50% capacity. You can get a little gauge of the bathtub ring there, the water skier, and about a 75-foot bathtub ring. I'll come back to that. Um, I went into the Grand Canyon, as you'd expect, but I didn't spend much time there because I figured this place is a national park iconic. It is protected. Of course, um, I had to connect kind of this source to sea trip. I was invited to take a river trip in a wooden dory and got to uh, do a little rowing. Um, my skills need a little improving. <laughs> Something to work on. Uh, but I didn't spend very much time there. Like I said, I was really interested in the water and where it was going. This is Lake Mead. We've all heard about it in the news. Uh, at the time, it was at about 60%. Again, it has now dropped to about 23%. And then I focused on those big straws, um, trying to basically give the visual story to this lifeline. This is the Central Arizona Project, th uh, 336 miles uphill to Phoenix and Tucson, to the Oasis Dream in many parts. Even though there's statewide restrictions in the state of Arizona right now, if you ask the average person, which I just did on a visit to Phoenix, they have no idea that 50% of their drinking water comes from this lifeline, nor do they even realize that there's a, a shortage or a challenge, which amazes me in how much work we have to do to get this story out further. Um, there are places like Las Vegas, which never re received as much water as other places, and they've been progressive in some areas, uh, using gray water to recycle in their swimming pools and golf courses. But this dream of turning the western arid west into a green space, um, turning it into the east continues, and we see it throughout. And as a result, with the overallocation of this system, because we used to think there was more water than there really is, and climate change and the growing population, you see rivers like the Gila, which is one of the longest tributaries of the Colorado River. You see it here in 1936, and you see what it's become today. 
And as you come downstream from the Gila, we come into the borderlands and you see one of these major diversions going to the Imperial Valley, one of the biggest users of water, which we may say, oh, that's terrible, but we're all connected to it because we all eat the Colorado River if you eat vegetables. If you eat carrots in the winter or you eat salad, this is the population that crosses that borderlands all the time and brings food to entirety of America's salad bowl. And then finally, when we come down to the U.S.-Mexican border, this is the Morelos Dam, last of 12 major dams on the system. We're looking due south into the Limitrof, which is 17 miles, which is a famous bird zone. Um, and it is, um, it is the actual U.S.-Mexican border um, for this region. And so when I grew up, I always heard about the Colorado River. I'd heard a little bit about the Delta. I didn't fully understand. People often think that the Colorado River ends in the United States. It doesn't at all. One of its greatest things was the estuary, one of the largest desert estuaries in all of North America. And when I joined up with a buddy who was paddling the entire length of the river, um, we went down through the Limitroff, and then just a couple miles past the Limitroff, we came to this. <laughs> Can you just paddle backwards and then forward for me? All I know is I'm not that excited to get into this water. You can turn the volume up on that a little. So this is what's become of the mighty Colorado. So that, what I consider the Frappuccino pit, um, what I've called um, lovingly, um, was remarkable for me to see per on a personal level. The river that I've grown to love, gr learned to swim in, learned to fish in, in the border regions, it went to nothing. And I packed up my boat with John, I guess optimistically, thinking that I may find some water downstream. Um, we didn't. We walked roughly 100, 150 miles through Cracked Earth Desert. Um, this estuary that Aldo Leopold described in 1922 when he went through in a canoe as a river being nowhere and everywhere was nothing but this. And I've heard people say over and over, well, who cares? That's wasted water going down there. Um, I can guarantee you that this guy cares, um, part of the Kokopa um, tribe. This is his ancestral fishing grounds, he and his family. This is where he grew up fishing. This is what's become of his landscape. And we've basically turned this lifeline into this dried tendril kind of I don't know, other world. And I remember walking through here and hearing nothing but absolute deathly silence, no sign of wildlife, nothing. The only thing out here maybe in the distance was a car horn. This is about 20 miles from the sea. And at this time, I was saddened, um, amazed that we'd never heard about this. So since 1998, the Colorado River has not reached the Gulf of California consistently, naturally at all. Um, on its own without support. Um, and that amazes me. It ran to the sea for six million years and we've turned it into this. But then, to my amazement, at this point I thought I was somewhat done with this story. Something happened, thanks in part to some people in this room who care and the hard work that people have been doing in conservation, is something that I thought would never change in my lifetime suddenly did. A small flow in one of these pulse flows started coming through and turned this landscape just outside of Luis, uh, Rio Colorado, the, um, just over the border, into this. Now this was eight weeks in 2014. Some said it was a waste of water. It was less than 1% of the Colorado's annual flow. Um, but the thing that amazes me is it not only brought back many of the vegetation and the plant life and the biodiversity and the birds, um, but it brought back the human spirit. And People came out in droves. They danced their horses. They celebrated. They sang mariachi. I saw guys in business suits walking around in the mud saying, our long lost amigo, the Rio, our agua has finally returned. And it was this great celebratory event. And as any river lover um, you'd expect would do, we decided that the best way to see this unfolding was to paddle it. So I joined some friends um, active in the conservation world. And we took paddle boards down through this region, which we quickly discovered wasn't that fun or easy. Um, I actually joined up with Oswald, who you just heard speak. He joined us for a section, and in one period, we actually had to dig out by hand a dam. There's Oswald basically helping move the Colorado River downstream through the delta through our hand-dug canal. But 
through some of the challenges, we also experience remarkable beauty. This is in the evening, down probably 60 miles south of the border, where this landscape where I had walked through just complete cracked earth, deathly silence, was suddenly vibrant and alive with the sounds of birds, the clapper rail we heard, coyotes howling, bees bugging, buzzing, and of course, mosquitoes came out a bit angry and pissed, a little unprepared. And then in that year, uh, we did see visually the Colorado River actually kiss the sea, which was remarkable, and it has since led to other conversations around the world about pulse flows, and there has since been subsequent pulse flows, um, one just in 2021 that also reached the sea through various ways of irrigation canals. It wasn't as big as this, but it is a sign of what we can do. And what amazes me is literally there was a handful of people that helped make that happen, and, and many of them are here today. Now, at this point, I thought I was absolutely done with the Colorado River. I'd worked on this for now almost a decade. Um, but again, I don't think the river was done with me. So I was invited to Grand Canyon National Park, the place that I figured did not need another photograph taken of it or another story. Uh, it's an iconic national park known all over the world. And I was asked to give a talk about the architect of the canyon, the Colorado River, of course, and what's the state of it and where is it going. And when I was there, I started hearing all these tales of how challenged they are, this national park. And I was amazed. And I was like, wow. So I um, talked to a friend of mine, a guy named Kevin Fedarko, who's worked down there as a writer. And I pitched a story to National Geographic that maybe one way to see this is get down and dirty and we would walk it. Um, I envisioned it would be walking like this through um, emerald marmalade light in the evening and um, along beaches, and it would be beautiful. Um, well, it was a little more than that, in part because the Grand Canyon is 277 miles long if you take the river, which is the highway through it in the basement. If you walk it, it's closer to 750 miles because you have to go up and down and around all the different distinct tributaries. And the reason is because this landscape is so fractured and so broken that in order to move downstream, in order to move laterally, you have to move vertically. And once you move vertically up into another layer of rock, you have to move back down to another layer of rock to either find water, perhaps in some cases food, which we stash strategically on the river, and then you add heat and no trail and bugs, everything else. And about, I don't know, 10 minutes after 9 a.m. after a cup of coffee, this is what you look like when you add those all together <laughs> on day two or three. Um, this took me 71 days to complete. Um, it was a long journey, but the point of it wasn't about a human suffer fest. That was just sort of the, the hook to bring people in to pay attention. It was about this place and the challenges. And this is one place that at the time, and still is today, under incredible pressure. This is the, the confluence for the little Colorado, the LCR comes in from the, the right side of your frame, the aquamarine blue, into the main stem of the Colorado. And we came there and we hiked up um, actually onto Navajo land and met Renee Yellowhorse, who is a Navajo woman who's lived herding sheep up on the top of the canyon there her entire life. And she was very worried, wanted to talk to us about this proposal a billion dollar tram development that was proposed to bring up to 10,000 people a day down into the Grand Canyon because everybody, the argument was that everybody should have access to the place, which there is an argument for that, I agree, but at what cost? Renee's argument was that it's gonna bring in huge pressure on the landscape, um, the water, of course, um, human waste, etc., and for her, and many others, this is their sacred space, this is their chapel, this is their Sistine Chapel, their open-air chapel, and you wouldn't argue to put a, an escalator to the, see the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, but this is what, how she equated it. And then downstream as we moved, I went and met with a different tribal community, the Havasupai tribe that frequently goes out and protests in front of one of the only operating uranium mines in the area. And if we're gonna find our way through climate change, uranium and Nuclear may be in the equation, but here is a big question because they mine up to 3,000 feet deep and they're worried about the water table. And in their case, their water comes right out of Havasu Creek. It pours right out of the canyon wall as it does in many places. Um, and they've done studies, hydrologists have done studies throughout the canyon and put blue dye on the top of the canyon and see where it emerges downstream 6,000 feet below. And to their amazement, it shows 
30 miles upstream, 30 miles downstream. So it shows we do not have a full understanding of the water table and the complexity of it and how rare and fragile it is and how it works. And so that's where we're in a complex situation. And then as we move downstream um, into the solitude and the grandeur of the place, I finally came to the west where it was abruptly changed where we saw what has become a new phenomenon on the western side. This is what one day of traffic looks like. I merged a picture where I spent 12 hours photographing every helicopter that passes through Western Grand Canyon to show what a day of impact looks like. Uh, 363 flights um, in the world of climate. Um, this is obviously a thing if tourism is going to be mechanized um, in our wilderness areas. And it has a lot of implications. I'm not against helicopters or air tour industry, but we often don't realize what collective impact looks like, and that's what I was trying to visually show. It had huge implications on, on the soundscape, of course, because in the West, all we heard was the, the whine of helicopter and turbine engines. Uh, Kevin and I reached the final boundary, the northwest corner of Grand Canyon National Park on an idle Tuesday. I think it goes to show how remote this place is, even within the United States, that the only demarcation is three metal posts jammed into the ground. Um, we did roughly 800 miles. We went through eight pairs of shoes. We collectively sprained four ankles, broke two fingers. I had one ankle surgery. They removed infected cactus needles. We lost two girlfriends. Uh, the list was long, but really it was about talking about this place and what we could document. And we learned a lot of lessons, and I think one big lesson is how can we transition the conversation to think of nature as being something more revered and sacred, particularly around water. One of the first lessons was how scarce and rare and how important water is, and we had to go find it every day. It puts it in perspective. But there was another layer to this, and that was the deep, profound layer of liquid silence that hangs over this landscape that we often don't talk about in nature and the natural sounds that come with it. I would often wake to the sound of bat wings in the morning long before the sun would come up, a sound I have never heard anywhere else. And so some of these places are truly magical for that and we're, as we create the world and make it more noisy and busy and on so many fronts, I think we're losing our ability to listen to nature. Uh, the second one, of course, is that there's this beautiful river flowing through there that's challenged and threatened, but there's a second river that comes out every night, and that's a river of stars that sweeps over, over overhead. And we've, we're losing our connection to the night sky as we flood our landscapes with light pollution. And then the third lesson for me, which in some ways is the most profound and still growing, is that we look in here and we often think it's empty and there's nothing there, but in reality, it is a living classroom of biodiversity, one of the widest ranges of biodiversity of any of our national parks, and the relationship with water is critical. But it's also full of history and archaeological history um, that date back in some places 4,000 years. This is a polychrome painting. We don't show where it is because there's been vandalization on some of these, but they've dated this at 4,000 years old. And so many say, well, where did everyone go that did this? The picture before was granaries from 900 years before in Nankoweek where they stored corn. Was there another giant mega drought that forced everybody out? Perhaps, but the reality is they're still here. There are 11 Native American tribal communities that live in and around Grand Canyon National Park, and Native voices are all throughout the Colorado River system. And back to Rene Yellowhorse, it goes to show how powerful their voice can be if we bring them to the table and listen. Renee, in her case, went out with nothing, bootstrapping her way around. She got 80,000 signatures. She teamed up with basically 12 Diné grandmothers, um, Navajo grandmothers. Only four of them spoke English, to give you perspective. And they went in front of the Navajo Council and were expected to lose, and to everyone's amazement, a few years ago, they won in a vote of 16 to 2 to prevent the tram from happening, to show that small people coming together can make huge impact on the sacredness of a place. For her, the argument was that that place is sacred and powerful and worthy of protection. And of course, today we're still on the precipice of how are we going to balance development and protection and conservation. And of course, with the Colorado River system, there is the native tribal voice that we need to bring back to the table because they actually have rights to 20% of the Colorado River's water system. 
Now, from that project, I've actually, I'm going to take us back upstream a little bit. This is some recent projects. Um, this is Glen Canyon Dam. Um, you probably heard about Lake Mead and finding bodies there. Well, this is the big structure above Grand Canyon. Glen, uh, Lake Powell is now at a 23% full. I just checked this morning. I've turned into a geek about this, which is remarkable. When I was working with my father years ago, it was at 60%, which seemed alarming then. And you see the detritus of this everywhere. Of course, there's already projections, we may hear about it tomorrow, of Deadpool, um, which could happen tomorrow, and that's when there's not enough water to run the turbines at the bottom of the dam here, which has huge implications on the river as a whole, Grand Canyon, et cetera. And we see the signs of the water disappearing, and there's a lot of what we call drought porn going around. Um, this is Height Marina, one of the many closed marinas. You can see the boat ramp there on the right. In Iceberg Canyon, you see the buoys that once marked floated 100 feet above. But then when you start to wander up into this place, which I did recently, you start wandering through the ghost forests, these forests that actually my father walked up in the late 60s that talked about as some of the prettiest forests he'd ever seen. And to my amazement, they're still standing. But when you come up into some of these tributaries, the bathtub ring, which sits you know, sometimes 100 and 200 feet above you, is starting to wash away. And what is happening is we're starting to get a national monument on par, if not more interesting in some level than the Grand Canyon reemerging. This is Gregory Arch, one of the biggest natural arches I've ever seen. It's been underwater my entire life. Now, water shortage is profound and scary on so many fronts, but it raises the question why we ever actually flooded this place to begin with. And then when you go further up the tributaries, you realize that nature is rebounding, and you see things like a freshwater orchid, a flower I didn't even know existed on this planet, has already started growing back in the upper areas of the tributaries. And you see the trickle, hear the trickle of water and the sounds that once emerged in these glens and alcoves, as John um, Wesley Powell described it. And then up in Willow Canyon, I saw an overhang um, cutaway that was larger than any I've ever seen in Grand Canyon. And it, it, it made me realize the silver lining here is that we may actually be learning about a landscape, a historic landscape that was filled with native tribal communities, but is on par or worthy of maybe even better in places than the Grand Canyon. And as a friend of mine who joined me um, said as we looked out at the bathtub ring one evening, he, he says, and I think it's a great lesson, is we've been so in an effort to control nature, but he said, well, nature, that's last. And I think we need to remind that. And his name's Len Nessifer, and I'm moving further upstream as I close here. Um, I convinced him to join me on another one of these crazy adventures where I convinced him to come down the Yampa River with me, northern state of Colorado, the last free-flowing river in the Colorado River system. And I said, Len, we're in a mega drought. I want to see what this river looks like under stresses. It can't control it with a dam. And he agreed, and within the first few miles, we had to drag our boats. Fifty miles later, we were still dragging our boats. Um, not a very fun quote, paddle trip. This is Tiger Wall, and historically you'd come through here, you would float past the Tiger Wall and you would kiss it for good luck before the rapids downstream. And as we walked past it, the river basically was drying up. And I was seeing for the first time in my life a river in the state of Colorado running dry. But then to my amazement, as we camped on the shore, just, just a little west of there, we're in Dinosaur National Monument, the river started to come back. And I later found out that the reason it did was there was a micro pulse blow. And the only reason that happened is because people that typically don't talk to each other in this world of divided echo chambers did. The ranchers spoke with the energy people, the energy people and the ranchers spoke with the environmental people, the hydrologists, the fish people. Everybody started communicating and say, hey, I can wait on a day here. I can wait a day there. We need water to keep the Yampa flowing and alive. And they did. And they kept it barely alive, but it connected. Endangered species of fish like the humpback chub that lived there continued. And you see there on the lower right the Yampa coming in to Echo Park, meeting the Green River. And then as we finally moved back upstream, back to the snowpack where we originated, the dust on snow phenomenon continues, um, making these rivulated kind of patterns as it melts off more quickly, making, making it aware that the issue we're having is only going to get worse. We're going to need more collaboration, more conversation all the way 
from the headwaters to the end because if you think this is an issue just downstream or just at the end, it's on your front doorstep here. Water shortage in the West and particularly this river is everywhere and we all need to get engaged and become more aware of it. Snow patterns are more and more fickle. That is a snow weather station where they measure dust on snow. That's just 10 years apart. That's the trend. I live in a town called Basalt where I used to get three feet of snow in my yard. I haven't had snow that sticks in my yard for the last four years. And of course, that resonates all the way downstream, right to the borderlands, right to the desert. And the storm of all of this and the urgency of everything around policy to collaboration is upon us. And I was just in the Grand Canyon last week working on a project and I experienced a rainstorm like I've never experienced on anywhere on this planet. And I've been very privileged to see many storms on this planet in different parts of the world. We were blown one mile upstream. I couldn't even see. My cameras, thankfully, could get this picture. But it is, it is upon us, the change, the unpredictable weather, climate. Um, and so we need more. Um, and these are some of the books that I've done that I think will be given away. Um, and I'll, I have one on silence, which resulted from the Grand Canyon Project. But um, if we're going to continue with the beauty of this place, from the mountains to the sea, um, we have a lot of work, so thank you very much. I think we were going to do questions. Is that the plan? Thank you, Pete. Oh, buddy, that's always inspirational. Um, where to begin? We've got a couple of questions, and realize you are the only thing that stands between these people and their snacks, so be eloquent, okay? Um, I'm going to go to the screen really quick because I think this one uh, really stuck out to me. And of all the changes you have seen um, in and on the Colorado River, um, which concern you the most and do any of them give you hope? I think you alluded to some of it, um, but now you also ended talking about storms and climate shift. So um, I would say uh, on the negative side that the storm and the weathered patterns um, concern me the most because I live in it and I'm usually on the front lines of these places and it is happening faster than we're acknowledging. Um, in the urban world where we live in protected buildings, it's, it's easier to forget or notice the changes. When you're out living in like a dirt bag um, and begging for food from your friends in tents, you start to notice it a little quicker. So that's the scary part. Um, the uplifting part is um, I'm looking over at Jen Pitt. There's um, other people in this room that have had been very proactive on making sure that the, the river itself, water in the river, water in the delta, um, water for birds, um, groups throughout this room are making a difference. And we just need more of it. Um, to see the Colorado River connect back to the sea, despite all the critics, whether it was too much in 2014 or not enough in 2021, is beside the point because it was truly magical. The spiritual uplift of that, I was like, all right, we can do this. We can actually engage and we can be a friend of nature and learn from it instead of trying to conquer it and destroy it. That's great. Um, given the time, we're gonna do one more question off the screen. So thanks to those folks using Slido. And again, feel free to gently, gently accost Peter during lunch, um, follow up with questions if they don't get asked. Um, so Pete, in some of these pictures, um, you know, you have the, the shiny, sexy gear. You know, boating gear is not cheap. Um, this, as to your point in the beginning, represents a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and the question is, given their massive potential for influence, how can the outdoor recreation industry help us move away from unsustainable water uses in the Colorado Basin? Is the industry aware of, of being part of the solution I, versus part of the problem? It, I, I say both. Um, Folks like yourself need to be on the front lines of saying, wait, if we're going to get out in the outdoors, we need to protect it and love it. Um, I see this trend. I do a lot in social media and have a following, and I don't ever mark where I go anymore because the loving to death has started to become a thing. The people come and they bring their urban lifestyle to the wilderness. Yes, it makes for sexy Instagramming and all that, but that's not why we have wilderness. Um, so we need to use a the recreational com community to become more of a voice of conservation. And I think we can, and I think there, that exists in primary fronts, but we need to get better at it and stronger on, on all fronts, from the gear we wear, um, how we use it, and what we do. So um, I will let you guys go to 
Luis's tent to get snacks. <laughs> Apparently, he has many. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Peter. Everybody, Peter McBride. Um, please do check out his books out there. They're, they're really incredible. And, and before we break for lunch, I just want to get, Mariana, where are you? There you are. Um, we had referenced the biennial um, a little bit earlier, and since if you're visiting here and you want to walk around a little bit during lunch, we just wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to understand um, what was out there from the biennial, biennial's perspective. So Mariana, you'll give a little bit of information, and then we'll break for lunch, okay? Hello everyone, I'm Mariana from the Biennial of the Americas, a nonprofit based here in Denver, Colorado. Katie and Deb, thanks so much for this inspirational morning. So I wanna make a fun invitation for you all. First, welcome to Denver. Katie told me that about 60% of you are from out of town, so am I. I'm Brazilian, living here in Denver for the past 10 years. No better place to be an immigrant. I guess it's the love for the outdoors and this notion that we can think beyond borders, correct? So I want to invite you all to a very brilliant installation from Guadalajara-based artist Gabriel Rico at Teotrex Plaza. You can have the information of the address. It's a five-minute walk. And this art installation will allow you all to think about wildlife, borders, conservation. He's, he's a well-known artist. He's been to Venice Biennale. There is an AR component to it that you'll be able to see all the wildlife that you should hang around here in downtown Denver. So if you need more information, ask me about it and we have information on the table out there. Have a great lunch, bye. Fifteen. Thanks everybody. No worries.